remember being a kid and they would have these red alerts and it was on the intercom. Okay. They would be like, and I remember this vividly because I even remember when I was a kid, I was like, this is so stupid. <laughs> they would call people to the sanctuary because John was in battle. Something was coming at him. And so all of these people would flock half dressed because you know, they were asleep. Yeah. It's usually in the middle of the night. They would flock to the sanctuary and then there would be, uh, you know, three, four, six, ten hours of prophesying for John and protecting him from the elemental spirits that were coming at him. My name is Scott Barker and I'm a former member of the Living Word Cult. In 2018, another former member named Shalom released letters onto Facebook that exposed a sexual abuse scandal that was being covered up by the leadership. At first, many assumed that the sexual abuse was only happening at one of the flagship churches in Los Angeles. But in the days that followed, more members from smaller churches all around the country stepped forward with stories of abuse by other shepherds and leaders in the church. Recently, I visited Macy Chadwick in Colorado to hear her stories firsthand. The first thing you have to do is to relinquish your own decision-making. Dethrone reason. There must needs be a holy brainwashing that, that will come forth in our life. The word is titled, Very Restricted Ministry. There's something that's going to happen here in you. What if Christ didn't do what he was sent to earth to do? What if John didn't do what God set him to do? What if Marilyn didn't take up that mantle? There's so many here that I don't want to hurt, but the abuse has to end. It just has to. Macy, we f I first started talking to you almost immediately after Shalom's yes. letters were released. Yes. Um, we, we ran into each other at... Um, Palmer Lake Church mm -hmm. when right after the letters were released and you also were very vocal online. And so I wanted to have you come in and talk about your experiences in the living word, um, in Colorado and in Iowa, and then also just some of the, some of the things that happened leading up to Shalom's letters being okay. released. And, um, yeah, and, and what happened after that and your experience is there. Can we start? We could even just start right there. You can tell us a little bit about um, that run-up to Shalom releasing her letters, and that'll back into your story a little bit. So okay. just like, you know, what was happening before she posted and what was your involvement? Okay, let me think about this for a second. Mm. <clears throat> I was actually... <laughs> As crazy as it sounds, I was back in the church when Shalom's letters dropped. Yeah, explain that a little bit. You um, that. I'm going to put it on camera how nutty I am. Okay. All right. I can do that. Frank and I, my husband, you'll see him in a minute. <laughs> uh, we were living in Missouri and... Um, And I know a lot of people in the church, the past church, are going to be seeing this, so they'll kind of understand, maybe. And I don't know how much of it is I'm just nuts, whatever. But I had this burning thing and something in my mind and was like, get your ass back to the church. And I'm going to curse a lot. Is this the camera you're looking at? You can look at me. Okay. But yeah. Okay. And you can curse as much as okay. you want. And you can let your, your nuttiness show because we okay. all know we were a part of a cult. We were. And that's the way yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, God was like, get your, get your butt back to the church. You need to get back to the church. And I fought it for probably almost two years. Just, we were in Missouri, everything was going relatively fine. We had a farm, everything was good. And um, there's this burning thing in your stomach <laughs> and it like never goes away. And so for me, that's always when I know that God is telling me to do something I most of the time don't want to do. And I didn't want to do that. I, the last thing I wanted to do was go back. To the church and uh, fought it and fought it and kind of verbalized it a little bit with Frank, not much. Um, and then one day he was like, 
we need to sell this place and we need to go back to the church. And I was like, Oh, what, what the hell? (laughs) What the heck? And, uh, so long story, hopefully short, we did, we sold our property in Missouri and we moved back here and started going to the Palmer Lake church again. And, uh, a lot of new faces that I didn't, you know, I didn't recognize, but I knew the names and things because I had gone to YASP with a lot of their kids um, that transplants. And I think what happened was they closed the, and I may have this wrong, but I'm pretty sure they closed the Santa Barbara church down and a lot of the congregation from Santa Barbara moved here. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, like we talked about, that was kind of a normal, natural thing that they did was reshuffle people and close properties down, sell them, um, and basically give the word to the people, you know, that there was, uh, they needed to move. Yeah. So, which is, which is really interesting because I mean, that's like normal, normal people that are part of normal churches yeah, no. don't move cause their church goes in. No. They just find another church nearby. Right. Um, and it's very normal for people in the living word to, when yep. a church shuts down, you've got to move to another right. center somewhere. You got to get yeah. your fix, right? You got to get your stuff. So, um, that's what happened. So we went back into the church and man, it took everything I could just to step into that old crappy ass building. The Palmer Lake building is old. <laughs> And, you know, anyway, um, a whole huge story about that. But we went back and, you know, the worship has always been where I'm like, okay, cool. I can worship. And but that's how we grew up. Right. So and from when I was even a kid that the worship is what did it for me singing. And, you know, I'm not a huge singing in the spirit person, but there was just something there um, that always just touched me. Mm-hmm. So that was part of it. But the overall feeling of the church was a little different, but basically the same. Um, and how did that feel coming back to it being the same? Did you expect it to feel the same or did you expect something? I know you I told- didn't know because I was, you know, I had that thing in the pit of my stomach where I'm like, okay, God, why the... Why the, why the fuck am I here? Why am I here? Um, I don't want to be here. Um, my, you know, my, my dad was thrilled because my dad was very involved with the Palmer Lake property. So the whole time I was in the church, I'm not, I'm, we didn't go every Sunday because I couldn't. <laughs> I just couldn't deal with it. We'd probably go twice a month. And uh, it took everything I could just to get in the car to go. And can you explain a little bit of that? Like, why couldn't you deal with it? Like, what about it made it so that you couldn't? Well, I had to go and see people that I knew from when I was a kid and I knew their backstories and their family issues and knowing uh, the abuse that they'd heaped on their children. Um, was really hard to go in and smile and, oh, love you, love you. <laughs> you know, that was hard. And I struggled with that when we were back. And I, I can't even say we were really back. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We were there. And um, the, f- the fact that I was set out, I was set out of the body when I was much younger, um, 19, almost 20 years old. And so the people that were there when that had happened, because it was very, um, everybody knew, you know, everybody knew that I'd been excommunicated, set out, whatever. And so there was still that weirdness with people, not everybody. Um, cause a lot of the people there, like I said, in my video. I don't know if we're going to do clips of that or not, but they're my aunts and uncles. Um, so it was great in some respects to see my family because it's my family. Um, but on the flip side of that, it was really hard to sit in the seats and listen to, 
um, the prophecy and all the crap and the the words and stuff from um, people that I knew were full of shit. You know, I'm like, God, I remember, I know what you did to your kids, okay? So it was hard to go in and be like, rah, rah, um, yeah, God's all over this. I, I, I couldn't. So that was why I couldn't be just completely involved because I just couldn't. I, I was like, I can't. There's too much history and um, there's too much of that underlying thing there that I still felt in my stomach. Like, oh, God, this is so gross, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And part of the reason I ask is because I have felt that same thing, too. And I don't know what it is. It's like hard. I mean, you're explaining it pretty well. I, ho- I, I yeah. don't know how to actually verbalize right. it. Yeah. But you've had that feeling like yeah. you're compelled. Yeah. Kind of like how we're doing this. Mm-hmm. I'm compelled. I can't. I don't feel like whatever God was trying to do. I don't feel like I've completed mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. It doesn't. <laughs> but it's just this feeling, and that's why I've been so verbal about it. Because yeah. um, it's done, but it's not done. And So what started your you being verbal about it? Where did that where did that start for you in the return? Um well the three sixty stuff. So I Can you explain that a little bit? As much as I know, yeah. yeah and yeah. it's, um, there had been a calling from Gary that everybody basically needed to write down all of the wrongs that had ever been done to them by who. And, you know, I think that's how it went. At least that's how it was, in a nutshell, that was how it was presented mm-hmm. to the body here in Palmer Lake. And I was at that service. So, um, you know, write it down. Uh, get it out. We want to know because we're going to take some kind of action. And they called them like the 360 surveys or something. And uh, and to me, that was just, that was just same old, same old. Because I had grown up where shepherds had done that. They're like, we want to know, write it down. Um we want to know all of these things and all the reasons why you think, why you're having a hard time or stumbling blocks or whatever. Mm-hmm. I hate them. I hate the lingo, but um, it's in us, right? Mm-hmm. It's in our DNA. So that the 360 stuff was really when I was like, this is just the same bullshit, same thing. You're going to use it as control. You're going to have everybody write all this stuff down. You're going to, you're going to set some people out. You're going to, you know, you're going to try to put band-aids here and there. And that's when I was like, yeah, this is the same old shit. Same old crap. And, um, and at the time, I was like, oh, I could write novels for you. Um, for the shepherds here. I think I can say this. The shepherds here were the ones that were in charge of compiling all of those 360 surveys from around the country, whatever churches are still left. Oh, so the shepherds that were in charge of Palmer Lake at mm-hmm. the time at the time were in charge of compiling all 360 yes. in all in every single fellowship. Oh, yes. interesting. I didn't yes. know that. Do you know why they were? I just were. <laughs> um, the shepherds here at the time were. And it's so stupid to call us kids, but kids, right? They had grown up in the church. So they were in like the around fellowship. your age. A uh, little younger, yeah. but yeah. Uh-huh. And I'd known them both when they were younger. Mm-hmm. Um, and But they were in charge of compiling all of that information. And I was like, okay, whatever. I got nothing to lose here. And I actually met with those shepherds, Frank and I did. And I put out and I just said, hey. And I don't know how I knew this because there would be no reason. I mean, I was just like, the only thing that's going to save this crap, this crap is if Gary gets up and tells the truth and like lays it all 
out on the line and, you know, and actually comes clean about his involvement with everything for these decades. And I told the shepherds that, and uh, because they were actually leaving to go meet with Gary to bring all this stuff that they had compiled um, to him. And so I told them my story. I told the shepherds my story. And, uh, and I just, and I don't know how I knew, and this was before Shalom's letters. I don't know how I knew that this was going to be, this might be something different, you know? Um, cause those kind of letters are what got me kicked out of the church to begin with. What kind of letters? Um, those, Hey, write down all your crap and, we want you to be as honest as you can about it. And uh, that was when I was younger, much younger. And so this is probably kind of a little confusing. Well, it's okay. We're going to, we're definitely going to get back into what we're talking about there. So I know it's a little bit of like a tease or whatever, mm-hmm. but the, um, what you're, what I, it sounds like you're saying is like, you've done this before. Oh yeah. You'd been through the same oh, yeah. thing. They had asked you to be honest, mm-hmm. tell you the stuff. And that resulted in you getting kicked out of the church. Yes. Yeah. So let's, let's see you go down this path and where it, where it goes. You want to go there? Well, not, not cause you're going to, you're going to talk about your, uh, but you want to keep talking about, okay. Yeah. But you want to talk about the 360, the, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that is something that Gary put out to everybody. And I'm, I think most of the people that are watching this are church people. So you'll know, I mean, you know, it was another thing where you write down who wronged you and go from there. Um, but I knew when I met with the shepherds on the most current 360, (laughs) that there was something different about it. And I think Shalom would, um, there was something in the air, if that makes any sense at all. There was just something. And I had talked to other kids that I'd grown up with, and there was just something different mm-hmm. in in the spirit. And Jesus, I freaking hate, I hate a, talking like yeah. that. But there was just something uh-huh. where it was like, okay, if Gary doesn't come clean and lay it out on the table, his reign is over. This is over. Um, and I was excited about that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I think for all the people that gave decades and decades of their lives, um, I almost felt probably sadistically in some ways excited that those people would have to be, the truth would have to be right in their face if Gary would have come clean. Mm-hmm on the crap that he did. And I sent that message with the shepherds that were here. And um, whether they relayed that or not, I don't know. But obviously it didn't happen. Did you write that or did you just, you told it to the shepherds? I didn't write crap. I was no way I was putting anything in writing. Because that's what, you know, that bit me in the butt before. So I just sent the message. And like I said, I even if I put it in writing, the odds of it actually getting to him, and and what would I, what would they have cared? Yeah. You know, I am the prodigy of um, just sheep, <laughs> you know, just a sh- who always wanted to get to that position, but never quite attained it. Yeah, um, which would be my dad, and. Uh, he was just a good sheep. He tithed, he worked, he gave and gave and gave of his time, of his money, of his relationships. You know, he was just a giver, and that's how I was raised. And I think, you know, that's how 90% of us kids were raised, right? So, um, so I mean, Gary, I mean, I know that Gary knew who I was because I had you know, had some dealings with him in the past when I was much younger. But what I would have said would have meant nothing. So maybe he should have listened. Maybe. <laughs> but there was just something in the air, and I, I think Shalom would say the same thing because I've talked to her, and she just had that burning, I've got to get this out. Mm-hmm. 
I don't know what's going to happen with the information, but I have to get this out. Yeah. And then, um, do you want to go? Yeah. So then I want to hear okay. what prompted you to do your, um, My the video. video, um, just to, just to comment a little bit on like that something in the air. Um, I'm sure it was a lot of things, mm -hmm. especially in our, in our, in our community, but in the larger world, like in the United States or larger culture, me too was happening. Yeah, it was like, it was just happening through Hollywood and all the other places. And so we and were I think, having, I, I think I said that during, I, yeah, a lot of is a blur. Um, cause when Shalom's letters first came out and things were crumbling, I mean, it was real obvious, real freaking quick mm -hmm. that things were crumbling. And, um, I had the opportunity to get in front of the Palmer Lake congregation and uh, basically puke on them. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just said what was in, on my mind and in my heart and like 90% of that, I don't even know what I said. But I do remember um, just saying, okay, I know why I'm here now because I get to witness this, you know, and I called people out from the pulpit <laughs> Uh, not specifics, but you know, yeah. um, it's a very different perspective when you're at the pulpit yeah. <laughs> looking out and looking at years and years of history with the people. I know that we kind of skipped over your video a little bit or we're, or I know you did two videos, so maybe we skipped I've one, done, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but I just wanted really quick, what was the reaction of the people in Palmer Lake when you got up there? Do you even remember it or was it like a, um, I could see the hatred from some people and it was very apparent on their faces because you got to remember I was the black sheep been kicked out um, and like, why are you even back? And I will say the current, or at the time, the current shepherds were like, they welcomed us back in. Mm -hmm. um, but when I called people out, just the loathing and the hatred on their faces. Yeah. And I'm like, well, at least this is honest, right? Mm -hmm. At least you're showing this. And before it was like, oh, we love you. We love you. Well, no, you fucking don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so there was that, um, but one of the other things that prompted me, um, was another girl had released a video, um, regarding an abuser, a sexual abuser, um, that, uh, was the same man that sexually abused me uh, from the ages of eight through 10. Um, he was a shepherd in Grand Junction, Colorado. There was a church there. Um, and it devastated me because I had never, ever told, I never told anyone about those incidents. And when I saw her video, it, it just, all I could think was you could, you could have kept this from happening to her. Maybe, maybe. Oh my goodness. Um, and that just over and over in my head, you, you could have kept this from happening to her because she, seven years younger than I am. So but then on the flip side of that, I was like, it wouldn't have made any difference, right? And, but I felt responsible. I still felt responsible in some way. Um, the shepherd <laughs> that uh, perpetrated <laughs> Those things, and I'm sure there's others, because if, you know, it, it only makes sense that there would be other kids that that would have happened to. Um, but I made my original video for her because she requested it. Um, and 
I'm sure you'll put clips of that video in yeah. here, and that's fine. Um, but that's what it was for me. Um, and I don't know how to shake that feeling of responsibility. And I don't know that I ever will. Um, I think I have a lot of questions around it and I want to talk sure. a little bit more, but, um, the, the feeling of responsibility, you know, I think I understand that you have that feeling and that's, you know, you're, you're going to, cause you feel it. And, but I, I don't think, you know, as somebody that if you were in that position and you were abused and you were a kid, the responsibility is not on you. The responsibility is on the adults and the people responsible around you to be looking for that and Absolutely. to set up an, an environment where you feel comfortable saying something, right. you feel comfortable being able to speak up. And the fact that, you know, one of the questions I have is, why did you never tell anybody? I mean, can you also maybe back up and just say when, about how old you were? I was eight. I was, it took place from the time I was eight till I was 10. So yeah, I was a kid. <laughs> um, and I know from a logical, educated perspective that that is the case, that the adults around me should have um, been in tune, <laughs> tuned in, <laughs> tuned in to what was going on, but they were not. And the fact that this individual was my shepherd at the time, and we were taught, you obey the shepherd. You don't question it. You don't, uh, basically, you don't have your own feelings. You do what they say when they say it, period. And um, the gentleman, <laughs> such a stupid word. The man. Um, the shepherd you're talking the about. The shepherd that I'm talking about that, you know, did the things. Um, I, I, and I've thought about this so many times. I don't ever remember him, like, telling me not to tell. Mm -hmm. I don't ever remember him, and there was never a threat. And it's just, and I've said this to other people, and they just look at me like I'm nuts. I was never afraid of him. You know, I was never... Um, even at eight, I knew, I knew what was happening. Um, I knew it was wrong. Uh, but there's just that thing. This is a man of God. You don't go against God, right? This is his representative and you do what they say when they say it without question. So, um, and I, I knew then by telling that I would cause a lot of problems. Number one, if I was even believed. I, a lot of it was like, they're not going to believe me anyway. Mm -hmm. He was my dad's very good friend. And uh, I knew that my dad would, number one, probably not believe me. And even if he believed me, he would have not done anything about it. So, and you knew that at eight, yeah, yeah, um, and we moved to Grand Junction from Shiloh. I lived at Shiloh, and um, you know, even though Shiloh was very a tight group at the time, I didn't feel like the people in Shiloh were like family. I think it was because you had people that lived outside, you had people that lived in the property, you know, but there was never like family. It wasn't a family feeling to me. Mm -hmm. And when I got to Grand Junction, man, there were all kinds of kids there. Uh, I made friends really quickly and easily, and I'd never done that because mm -hmm. we moved churches quite a bit. So it was just like, you know, new schools, new everything. So when we got to Grand Junction, it felt we were my whole family, um, I felt accepted and family. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that to go away. Yeah. And I knew that if I told that we would more than likely be shipped out of there. If 
anything ever came of it. And um, so... Yeah, that's a, um, the family stuff and the community is a, is a lot of the reason people want to be a part of this. Right. And that's really central to being a human. Yeah. And so losing Having that is almost more devastating than some other right. things. Yeah, I can see why you're, you know, now you have friends and all that. I was also similar situation in Southgate. It was just like Jack and I were the only kids, right. you know. And so when you get to be around others your age, it's important to keep that. Um, I wonder if you could explain a little bit about what that community was like um, and how it allowed the shepherd to have access to you like that. How did, how come your parents weren't around How come, or whatever? How did that happen? Well, um, my little brother, Zion, my little brother uh, had a lot of medical problems. And so, um, there were a lot of times where my parents were with him, taking him to doctor's appointments, hospitals, and things like that. Or he was with me during those times as well, but he was a quadriplegic. (laughs) And so, you know, you could put him in one place. (laughs) He wasn't, you know, he wasn't like running around little kid. Um, But the other thing is my parents worked a lot and they had to, you know, just to be able to support us. And I always wondered though, why nobody questioned, and I wasn't the only kid. I mean, at the times that the touching happened, I, my brother and I were the only ones there. Um, And then by myself sometimes too. I I always wonder why nobody questioned why this shepherd who was a business owner um, always wanted kids to come on over to his house. I don't know why, you know, and and honestly, my parents thought that they were leaving us in a safe place. And, you know, it was relatively safe if you don't count the the touching. (laughs) Um, So that, like I said, I was not, by far, I was not the only kid that was left at his house. So that's why I know there's more. But um, he did commit suicide in 1998. And so everyone in the church will know exactly who I'm talking about. For the most part, I would imagine um, anyone that's been around for a while. Um, And the interesting thing is I was around him even after, because I remember 10 years old, my little sister was born. And I begged my parents. I begged them. I'll, I'll watch the kids. It'll be fine. I, I can handle it. I'm good. I can do that. And I did. I watched my siblings and my, my disabled little brother. Yeah. Um, and that was so that they didn't, you know, drop everybody off over at his house, at the shepherd's house? Is that why you wanted to watch them? I just didn't want to be at his house. Yeah. And... Um, Did he set up some sort of, was it like a, a babysitting thing or like a daycare situation or no, is it just a casual? It was just very casual. There yeah. was, especially during that time. I mean, I was eight, so we're talking seventies, yeah. <laughs> you know, everything was just pretty free flowing and, and he had, he ran a business from his house. And so they had workshops, um, like there was the house and then it was like all of his work buildings and everything. Yeah. And my mom thought that she was leaving us with his secretary, which she was never around. I see. So my mom thought that that was okay. I mean, they wouldn't have questioned him anyway, you know. I know they wouldn't have. Yeah. Um, so, but, and a lot of times there would be, you know, 15, 20 kids there, not when the actual physical touching happened yeah. to me, but there were always kids in now, but it was a very communal type setting. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, probably half the men in the church worked for him in his business. So, and I don't think it was technically a kingdom business, but I, I know that a lot of the money was funneled. Oh, okay. I know so, it was. So he, was he doing the, was he doing the business at the church or was it, it was his house that he 
ran his business out of. He did just interesting. It was in a little little like suburbish of Grand Junction called Whitewater. And um there was the church property and it was a regular, you know, church. Um and then literally down the road was his house and his shop. Okay. So I mean it was like Easily a walking distance yeah. between the two. Okay. So. So all the kids. So that's where everybody just dumped their kids with uh, with him at his house and shop. You know from. Yeah. It was the. It was. I would say in their minds, all of that property was considered the church. Oh, okay. I mean, it was, but it wasn't. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And I believe. I think this is how it. His business. His parents. His dad actually started. Mm-hmm. And he took it over, but he did employ probably a good 60 to 70 percent of the men in the church. Wow. So in, in addition to That's being... That's why there's so many electricians. <laughs> because of him. Wow. And he did. He trained. Yeah. You know, he trained them. And uh, I mean, from what I've been told by the people that worked for him, he was very fair. He always paid them. I mean, there was never... But then, like you said that money gets funneled back in to the church, right? With tithes and everything else. So, but for everything I've been told, he was fair in that respect. And he didn't, um, you know, you talk about Gary and Marilyn, people went and cleaned their house. And uh, I don't remember that with him. He was paid stuff with him, like in his... Yeah, the people, the men that worked for him were definitely paid. Well, it's interesting still because what it does is it keeps everybody close. I mean, mm-hmm. he's the shepherd of the church, and then also they're working for his business. Right. Um, they're dropping his, they're dropping their kids off mm-hmm. with him. It's it's an incredible amount of access and power. Yes. Is what he accumulated. Absolutely. Um, by by setting all that up, so. But I don't know that that was um, unique to the body. Yeah. Either. Sure. You know, I think yeah. that kind of stuff happened. Right. In other areas, obviously different businesses, different things, but, um, and I think that even goes back to when John, the founder, <laughs> you know, I still have a hard time with that because for me, when I was growing up, he was the prophet. He was, you know, and so they kind of like diluted that uh-huh. in the more recent years. Now he's just the founder, which technically, yes. Yeah. But when I was a kid, he was, you know, <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear you explain a little bit more of what how people referred to him in the 70s and 80 or, you know, early 80s, because um, I do hear that a lot today from people that still follow the teachings of John Robert Stevens. Oh, no, he was just, you know, they're just interesting teachings and that kind of stuff. It's it, even though like 90 percent of them were plagiarized. <laughs> yeah, sure. Exactly. But he he like. So what was he? he what did they call him? Um, and how was how did people God? <laughs> Yeah, did they? Did you ever hear? Basically, it? yeah. I mean, um, I don't ever remember somebody going to John. Well, yeah, I do actually. <laughs> you know, you're my God. You're my God. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but that's how he was portrayed. I remember him walking into services and things at Shiloh, and it was like, you know, the people that just. Right. <laughs> I, and this is so strange, man. I'm like, I'm not a medium or anything like that. But even as a kid, kid, I always thought it was a little weird. Yeah. Um, just watching grown people just lose their shit when he would walk into a room. You're like, he's just an old man. (laughs) You know, he's just an old fat guy. (laughs) What do you think it was about him that... I don't know. But he had to have something um, because there's too many people that, I mean, like they gave everything. Yeah. They gave futures, you know, their money, everything to him. So I think that he probably had, I call it parlor games because, but watching grownups, right? Mm -hmm. Just, and you're thinking, what the hell am I missing? And then you were told that, Hey, if you don't have a revelation, there's something wrong with you. Right. Um, and I mean, I was, you know, I had, he laid his hands on me. I have a word over my life, the whole thing. Do you um, remember what your word was? <laughs> it was more of a word to my dad. Well, it makes sense. Because 
it's interesting, and this you'll get a kick out of this. Mm-hmm. I remember being at Shiloh, and I was, I was young. I was probably, and this was before we lived at Shiloh. Um, and was probably right, because you know the sanctuary was there before the actual construction of Shiloh. I mean, they okay. built the sanctuary. I think this is how it happened first. Because I remember being on stage in the sanctuary. I couldn't have been more than four or five. And uh, we didn't live there at the time. But John laying his hands on me. And this is embarrassing for me to talk about. But Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Picture this short little fat girl. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> right? And he put his hands on me. And I was... I remember looking out at the sea of faces, and I really wanted to be a ballerina. That was never going to (laughs) happen. And I started twirling with his hands. Uh He did not find it amusing. Um, Everyone laughed, you know, and everything. That's one of the memories that stick out in my mind, because I was, like, going in circles. And he said something. I don't remember what he said, but, you know, something about a whirling dervish or something. Uh I don't know. Um, But... The word over my life was to my dad, from what I remember and what I've read, um, she's going to do a lot of stuff that you don't understand. Just love her anyway. Mm -hmm. So was that prophetic? I don't know. Maybe. (laughs) It almost fits, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, So. Interesting. (laughs) But I, and I was around uh, John again, because we moved to Shiloh when I was in the second grade and we lived there and I don't know if you've ever heard of the sieges there used to be these almost like preschool of prophets things where everybody would just flock to the building okay and I lived there with my family all in one little dorm room um during the victory siege and that one there had been like two or three before that and I don't remember the names of them but the victory siege uh, there were probably th- between three and four hundred people living at the building. Wow. Um, and I remember that siege went on for a freaking ever. Um, what's what's involved with the siege? I honestly, <laughs> I'm still like, it had a lot to do with protecting John. Okay. Because um, I, and I could be totally wrong on this, but I have a feeling that during that time was the same time that he was trying to divorce Martha. Okay. What year about? <sighs> Let's see. I, I was, it was probably 77, 78, uh-huh. something. In okay. There. Yeah. That's about right. Yeah. So I mean, just by the grade I was in, cause I did go to centers of learning at Shiloh and it was just a bunch of, God, for lack of a better word, they were kids too. I mean, young adults in their 20s. Very few older people. I mean, except for the diehards that were, had been at Shiloh since, you know, the beginning. And like I said, it was preschool of prophets. Okay. I think if I had to guess, this was probably the precursor to school of prophets. Okay. Um, but they would... All these people would come and stay at Shiloh, like almost live at Shiloh. And uh, I remember being a kid and they would have these red alerts and it was on the intercom. Okay. They would be like, and I remember this vividly because I even when I was a kid, I was like, this is so stupid. (laughs) They would call people to the sanctuary because John was in battle. Something was coming at him. And so all of these people would flock half dressed because they were asleep. It's usually in the middle of the night. They would flock to the sanctuary and then there would be, uh, you know, three, four, six, ten hours of prophesying for John and protecting him from the elemental spirits that were coming at him. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how did they what did prophecy look like and how did they protect him? In the she thing. got me. I mean, I remember what prophecy looked like because it was all these grownups just losing their shit. You know? I mean, you know, violent intercession. And, uh-huh. um, and then at one point, um, and I remember this vividly, because my mom kind of tried to protect me a little bit. I was, 
I was young. And she'd be like, no, you're going to stay here with me or whatever. But I had managed to get down to the sanctuary during one of the red alerts. And I have to imagine there was a lot of drinking going on because a group of like six, seven guys led by a very prominent member that you would know their name if I said it. But what part, what church were they? What? Um, well, he would have been, he would have been in APCO. Okay. If you like, More recently. had, if you would sped up time, he would have been part of APCO. Okay. Um, but he led about six other guys and they broke every light in the sanctuary. Why? I don't know. <laughs> How? Um, throwing things at them, getting things and breaking them. I have no idea why. It was just like a thing because they were so violent in their thing. And I remember I was standing there in glass because it was the old, yeah. you know, light fixtures. Uh-huh. And uh, glass was just like falling. And I remember my mom reaching in and yanking me out because I was just watching glass <laughs> come down. And it was just because they were so violent in yeah, their spirits yeah, yeah. And, and everything. I just remember looking at these grown men going, what the, f- the hell? What the hell? <laughs> and Sean wasn't even in there. Uh-huh. He was in sequestered in his apartment. Yeah, he was being battled. He yeah, he was. Uh, yeah. yeah, they were, they were, you know. Breaking the lights. They I broke every even... single light in the sanctuary. I've heard, I've heard. I'm totally guessing here, but I've heard people say, you know, the electronic realm is uh, is next to the it's demonic. Like an well, avenue. An avenue yeah, to the for demonic. The demons. Yeah. I mean, and you were talking about this, and I, I just remember thinking, even, and I was six, seven at uh-huh. that time, thinking, what the fuck is wrong with these people? <laughs> I really do. And you I were re- swearing at six and seven already? Probably, <laughs> in my mind. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, you. that's exactly the <laughs> so picture it was that I just, made of what a scene It was is. all these people and like literally sleeping in the hallways at Shiloh, yeah. waiting for the red alerts oh, so they could go and um, protect the prophet. Yeah. I mean, really, that's what, and they, they literally believed that mm-hmm. they, I mean, it wasn't fake for mm-hmm. most of them. It wasn't fake. I mean, that was really they thought they were there and they were actually doing something in the spirit realm. Yeah. Oh, what a bunch of bullshit, right? Yeah. But they really, really believed it. Mm-hmm. Well, so. yeah, um, I believe that they believed it. I mean, that's how, that's how John was very convincing, it seems like. He was. And mm-hmm. I, and honestly, there was, obviously, because these people wouldn't have, there wouldn't have been this, movement for so many for so long if there wasn't something there and my dad I mean he very much had an experience um and that's his story so I won't get into that but he but that experience that he had with John set the tone for the rest of his life and uh I think that's so fascinating about it because it's it's you know if if you're met if your yardstick for what something if for what is real is the way that somebody believes or um, the actions that they take based off of their belief. Th- this was very real for a oh, lot of people and absolutely. they really still hold on to that stuff. Um, so now that we've gone on this really fun <laughs> tangent, I want to <laughs> kind of bring it back to the, um, okay. to uh, the letter or, you know, when, cause we, we stopped just short of you posting your, your video Okay, um, I and, can. Yeah, and just talk. And you wanted to know how people responded to that. I want to know how people responded to it. I want to know how you tied in with, because were you also like Charity? Were you somebody that was early on with uh, Shalom? and not, 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 um, not directly. Not directly, okay. But through the girl that had been molested by the same shepherd. Okay. She was. Okay. Yeah. And I had a relationship with her. Mm-hmm. So I know Charity talked about a group of women. I was not part of that mm-hmm. until after. Right. But this other individual was yeah. who I had been. And I think I told you that when we talked in Palmer Lake after everything broke. Mm-hmm. I'm like, there's like this loose network yeah. of us. And I wanted them to think that it was a much more. Because at the time, Shalom was getting death threats. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Fuck you. I mean, sorry. Fuck you guys. Yeah. 
just knock it off and tell all your co compatriots to freaking knock it off too. Well, the thing is you, you make it the loose network for sure, but it was, I mean, it was serious. These, that you guys uh, are, you ladies were all very powerful. Um, and, and it showed just how speaking the truth um, through your video and through the letters that Shalom posted and just even comments on Facebook was ripping this thing apart. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think, you know, you, you got Gary to stick his tail between his legs and run, you know, real in a way. fathering ministry, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, real, just real showed know, that. Yeah. He really yeah. showed uh-huh. to me. I'm like, well, that's what you're made of. Dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so tell, so tell me about the, the letter and how you got, or not the letter, the, the, the video. video. Yeah, how you got there. Well, you this will show you how big of balls I have. <laughs> um, I made that video, like I said, for this other individual. Um, and after I got up on the pulpit and called people out on their bullshit, um, I posted that video on the church Facebook page. Oh, which church Facebook page? The Palmer Lake nice. church Facebook okay. page. Okay, yeah. Um, because everyone that had seen the video was like, this is so powerful, this mm-hmm. is, and I was like, that's just my story, you know? Yeah. Um, but I was getting all kinds of pushback from those same people, and then there were some people that weren't there, and they're like, I don't understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, this is a great way to just disseminate at least my story to everybody. Mm-hmm. And then I put it on. I put it on the church Facebook page. And everybody was at the page because they were all trying to figure out what's going to happen, what's going on. And, you know, Facebook, I'll tell you what, you can say a lot of shitty things about Facebook. A lot. But, but <laughs> yeah. it was instrumental in taking this crap down. Uh huh. Well, you know, just to like, because yes, like that, the, that platform, everybody was on it mm-hmm. and that's different from like the, the, um, cult, sure, education. cult education. Yeah. It just was a more modern place. Um, but it is, yeah, it's a, it's a slate and you guys, what you said and what you put on there, that's is really the work and Facebook. Yes. It was a platform. It was, yeah. but it was a way to connect everybody yeah immediately. Right. Exactly. It wasn't, you know, and it wasn't watered down and there was no editing, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? So I did, I stuck that, uh, video that I made, uh, on the church Facebook page Mm -hmm. and I got a phone call almost immediately from the shepherd here Uh in Palmer Lake. Um, the female shepherd. Yeah. Um, a husband wife duo. It was yeah. a husband and wife mm-hmm. duo. And the female shepherd that I already talked to and said, Hey, Gary's gotta come clean. Yeah. Um, call and she's like, We just we we need you to take that down. Okay, why? I mean, I use some pretty choice language in there, but shit, this is living yeah, where it's everyone has it. No. She's like, Well, we're just we're just gonna use that only for um how did she put it? We're only using the Facebook page for information on scheduling of services. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And she's like, I just need you to take it down. No. I said, that's fine. Uh-huh. So I did. And then right after that, I said, I will no longer defend that couple. Yeah. Because um, that showed me exactly where they stood. Mm-hmm. And she did mentioned to me it's making people uncomfortable and I said good yeah that's what I want it to do right um but I took it down and uh and then I never had any more contact with her mm-hmm. either one of them mm-hmm. well I take that back there was one other time um but that showed me that no you're not and yes your leadership whatever but you know what your shit's done. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. I, and that's when I went, okay, I will not defend them anymore. With these, you know, the shepherds, I don't know them. You can definitely know them better. Um, and that kind of response is absolutely unacceptable. I think especially, but it's also very typical Mm -hmm. of the living word. It's, uh, it's the, like, we, they need to be in control of the information. That's what the 
you know, oh, whole thing absolutely. is about. It's scheduling for the Facebook. Come on. But the, you <laughs> know, the interesting thing to me was uh-huh. these were admins on their Facebook page. I don't know why they just didn't take it down. Yeah, you can just delete it. I'm like, you can just get rid of it. They didn't. It, they wanted me to take it, and they wanted. So I don't know what that was about. I think that was just a control. Yeah. Thing. It's it's whether you know they're the most evil people in the world or they're fully innocent. It kind of doesn't matter because they were raised in this thing too and trained to behave a certain way. Oh, yeah. And especially as shepherds, they were trained to control the information For sure. and. The talking to you and keeping it a phone call behind the scenes Mm -hmm. is the way that they manipulated everything. It's backroom meetings. It's one-on-one. It's that's how they manipulated anything. And so they knew that confronting you directly was probably the better way because I don't know if Facebook does something where if you're an admin, you hit remove, it shows that it was removed, but um, I think it does. Yeah. So So it, it, it was better optics for the congregation that I took it down. Um, I should have probably not. I should have been like, screw you. You want it down, you take it down. I did it at the time. Same conditioning. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you know. Yeah. And I never looked at them as my authorities. I mean, they were kids. Yeah. I knew them when they were young. And um, and I never, you know, I never went in going, oh. Yeah. Oh, we love you. We love, you know. I was oh. just like, yeah. Yeah. So, um. I, if that... I don't know what that means or not. Well, did you get any ever? Did anybody, do you think anybody ended up seeing it oh, on yeah, there? Oh, yeah, quite a yeah. few. What was the, what was the response um, from the general? Why did you take it down? Oh, really? Well, yeah. and I just point blank, well, I was asked to uh-huh. by the shepherds. Gotcha. And, oh, why? I wanted to watch the rest of it, or it was cut off in the middle, or, you yeah. know, whatever. There was several um, that saw it. Then I had... <sighs> Elders from the church um, come onto the Facebook page that was only there for scheduling and malign me, basically. Don't believe everything you hear. Don't believe everything you see. And then those people would contact me directly. Well, well, what happened? We want to know more. And so I just told them, point blank. Hey, everybody. I make videos all the time about stupid um, stuff and post them, but this is probably going to be the most important, at least to me, video I've I've ever made. I'm going to do my damnedest not to cry through this whole thing, but I've been crying for three days. Um, I have no more nails left. I've bitten them all to the quick. Anyway, my name is Macy Johnson Chadwick. Uh, I was not born into the Living Word Fellowship, but my parents joined uh, the original (laughs) church when I was less than a year old, so I have no memory of anything else. My physical abuse was in Grand Junction, Colorado. And if you've seen post then you know what she went through and it devastates me it devastates me that she went through that because I went through the same thing the same person he's dead killed himself thanks for taking care of that when God anyway the physical you know I always told myself it really wasn't um you know, I wasn't abused because I was never penetrated and I wasn't touching um, enough where I knew that it was wrong. And I never told anybody because I knew it wouldn't make any difference. I was taught that you obey the shepherd no matter what you do whatever they say without question always I haven't spoken out much about this um, because my dad is still very involved in the church and I think that's probably why a lot of us have kept quiet 
because there's wonderful, amazing, given people that have sacrificed their families, their money, their futures for you know, decades. Decades of people abused and they were abused too. Only difference with that is they were adults and we were children. Dang it. I didn't think there was anything left in there. So, that's my story. After you posted your video, after Shalom posted her stuff and there's right. comments on there, did you spend time reading comments oh God, yes. on there? And is that where you're getting this idea that it was happening the whole time um, well, in different places? I, there were other shepherds, and I guess I can say that firsthand because um, I was told things uh, and this is before everything happened by a couple of individuals that had been victims of a shepherd in the sixties. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't a new, I mean, pedophiles are not new. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think pedophiles in general are drawn to that kind of access and organization because nobody questions it. Mm -hmm. Right. You're God. I mean, you're in a, you have this, uh, this covering, right? You have this, uh, I know, I hate it. I hate it, uh -huh. but it's in there. You have like this umbrella covering that, of course, that would never happen because you're a man of God. Mm -hmm. The apostolic fathering exactly. ministry. Yeah. Exactly. So I think that draws people with that propensity in. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. I mean, it's not, and so it's not, and we, you know, we've talked so much about Rick and I can say his name cause uh -huh. you know, um, Rick was just a little offshoot of that. There were a lot of, um, individuals that were drawn in and given positions of power, mm -hmm. uh, whether they just cause they could play the game or they like in my instance had, um, something to give financially yeah. and everything. Otherwise, um, they were given positions of power. Yeah. So I know that, um, just to be transparent with all of this, because it is, it's really, these are serious allegations and a lot of them were just like thrown out in comments mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, do you believe what you've heard and what you've read in, you know, general, obviously not going to every single thing, but do you believe that? And if so, why do you believe it? As far as people commenting people, and people giving comment, their stories? Yeah, their stories. And yeah. Because I grew up in it, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, now there's a couple of things where I'm like, whatever, <laughs> but, uh, I don't think people that have actually been through that and not just the sexual stuff, but all of it, mm -hmm. I don't think they spew for what? for nothing. Mm -hmm. That's a very, uh, God, I don't even know how to put in this words. I would have never talked about my sexual stuff if it hadn't have been for somebody else coming mm -hmm. um, and talking about their experiences and it just happened to be the same person. Because yeah. I thought when he killed himself, I would never have to freaking deal with it again. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember too, I was still going to church with this guy and um, he was still at all the functions and everything. And that it was so minor When you, the juxtaposition of the other kinds of abuses that went on, his little snippet in that two years was so minor. I don't know if that. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's really interesting. I mean, for me to hear you say that that's so minor, you know, and I understand and respect that if, you know, that's what you feel about it. It's, it's, um, it does speak volumes to the other types of abuses that we're going to talk about. And, um, 
control and manipulation that they do that really affect your life. But Mm -hmm. that too affects your life, you know, and, um, it did. I mean, I have, I mean, (laughs) it's affected that those two years has affected my, um, physical life from then till now. Uh, the other things that happened have, I don't even know how to verify. Have affected me, just me personally, on a much uh, greater I see. thing. I don't. Yeah. It's hard to compare. It one. is. And yeah, there's, different. it's different people. It's different times. Yeah. It's, there's not a comparison, but there's a comparison, yeah. you know? I want to ask a stupid question. Yes. Um, that I think a lot of, a lot of people and probably a lot of men ask or themselves you were eight and 10 years old, you're a kid, the shepherd abused you, then you grow up and you're in the church and he's still a shepherd or he's still a leader, he's still a leader. He was a leader, yeah. yeah. Um, here's the stupid question. At what point, and, or not at what point, but why at no point did you ever feel like you couldn't tell somebody or run up to him and punch him in the face or something stupid like that. Gosh, this is going to come off as so... Uh, no, no, no. My question's dumb. So okay, what, no, right. it's not. Um, how can I put this? I was never fearful of him. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't want to be around him, you know, and I avoided him as much as I could. Um, but I never feared that he would do something to me. Other shepherds, I was afraid of. And I don't, (laughs) I don't know if that comes off. That, those two years, and it was, you know, it was four different, four different times. Mm -hmm. Um, Snippets, you know, quick. Um, Would you feel comfortable talking about one of those? Or, um, yeah. I mean, okay. <laughs> it centers around a bean bag. <laughs> um, this shepherd had a bean bag in his sunroom. And, you know, when you're a kid, a bean bag's pretty cool. We didn't have any cool furniture like that in my house. <laughs> you know, it's a bean bag. And I know for somebody your age, you're like, that's it's the 70s. I it's the 70s. It was a beanbag, and it was, like, cool. Um, with the exception of one other time, everything that happened to me happened on that beanbag. And, um, and I put this in the video. I was never penetrated. Um, so in your mind, you do this thing, well, it really wasn't that big of a deal. You know, a lot of touching in every area, um, but short. I mean, it was, you know, we're not talking like, you know, long periods of time, but I was never afraid of him. I didn't think that he would physically harm, hurt me, harm me. I can't say that I felt that way about other shepherds that I've had and designated relationships. Let's talk about designated relationships because the shepherd here in Palmer Lake, and this is not current, um, the shepherd when I was growing up here, I was afraid of. And um, I had seen him physically hit other kids that weren't his own. And so there was always that thing. And I know you talked to Charity a little bit about this. What are these people capable of? Um, If you would have asked me that when I was 14, 15, 16, I think that they would have... They would have been, I think they could have made us disappear pretty easily. I mean, if you think about YASP, 
a young adult summer program. How hard would it have been? I mean, kids die in farming accidents all the time. Or they did, <laughs> you know. I, um, we were a lot of times at YASP without any parents there. Um, a lot of times our shepherds were there. I don't know. And that's, what are these people capable of? I think they were capable of murder. Really? I mean, think how dedicated, and that's going to sound so melodramatic, I guess, but think about how people were just so dedicated. One word. I mean, let's face facts. If Marilyn had said that person. Thank you for watching. That was Macy Chadwick. Please like and subscribe.